And good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you are joining us from. Uh, today is going to be an overview of uh, IP optical architectures that uh, Ribbon uh, supports, uh, some a little bit of design uh, consideration, uh, and then uh, a little bit of technology. Uh, today is designed to be sort of a high-level overview. Uh, as uh, Lance was mentioning, we have a series of tech talks coming up. Uh, each one of the following tech talks is going to cover uh, these topics in more detail. So again, today uh, we're going to touch on uh, each of these, give you some practical examples, uh, and uh, hopefully that will be of some use to you. All right, so uh, when we approach an architecture, uh, a, a, a designed uh, challenge, right, or design consideration, um, what we want to do is look at the applications, uh, at the traffic patterns, at the fiber topology, perhaps it might be wireless topology, uh, really all of those considerations. What is it that you are looking to do across your service area? Uh, and then with the uh, number of tools that we have in our tool bag, uh, we, we look to apply each of those uh, appropriately to, to meet to meet your guidelines, right? So certainly to meet service requirements, but also at the at near the top of, of every list is going to be cost efficiency, right? Uh, and that is a very broad statement. It's not just entry level cost, but it's return on your investment, uh, capex, opex, uh, and then the uh, the length of time that our equipment is going to be in your network. Uh, and how long is it going to be able to serve you? Uh, you know, obviously trying to avoid forklift uh, architectures uh, and uh, forklift uh, uh, replacement strategies. So the way we do this, uh, this is a triangle that I came up with years and years ago, but it really has, uh, has served, I think, uh, our customers well. Um, the upside down triangle, the first thing I'll point you uh, point your attention to is the cost arrow at the top. So the broader that triangle is, the more that layer costs, right? And so as you kind of look at it, you'll see that layer one is at the bottom uh, and is the narrowest. Layer two switching is in the middle and layer three routing is at the top. So once you look at that, you know, a lot of you are probably nodding your heads, right? Yeah, absolutely. Routers are the most expensive thing that we can uh, buy when we get out into the uh, into capex and and upgrading or or building a new network. Um, capabilities of routers, of course, are are right at the top. Right, you can pretty much do anything you want with a router. Um, but would you build a network with only routers in it if there were a less expensive way to do it? Well, the answer to that, of course, is no. So. This is uh, an example of, uh, of our first design approach, and that is uh, looking at uh, will a layer one design accomplish your objective? Layer one being purely optical. So some people call these dumb pipes. Uh, that's, that's one way to call them, right? They're, they're certainly not smart in, the, in terms of layer two uh, ethernet switching or layer three routing, but um, but there is some intelligence in uh, certainly how the network is designed and then also how it operates. But all, all together, the layer one uh, transport uh, it is typically a foundational element of a network uh, because it's very efficient. It's, it can be massively scalable to terabits uh, of, uh, of traffic uh, and uh, and then it's also pay as you grow. So you can turn up a single wavelength uh, in the beginning, and then you've got uh, basically dozens of plug and play wavelengths to turn up uh, into the future. So our very next uh, tech talk is gonna go into a lot more detail on DWDM and the optical layer. Uh, today, basically I wanna to establish to you that, that the layer one network, what we call the Apollo platform, uh, it is, uh, is certainly a consideration for the foundation of your network uh, for the reasons that I've just described. Um, here's one example. This is a longtime customer of ours, Georgia Transmission. 
this is a power generation and transmission uh, company uh, in Georgia, of course. Uh, what started out as a initial 10 gig network has grown to a network that now carries 200 gig per wavelength. Uh, it services 38 electrical co-ops across the state uh, with both their internal and external traffic. So they are now providing uh, residential broadband service, wireless backhaul, wave services. Obviously with a statewide uh, consortium type network like this, there are innumerable opportunities for revenue from uh, other co-located uh, uh, providers. And so uh, this type of environment is something that uh, really lends itself to a layer one design. Uh, and again, what we call an Apollo design, Apollo is our layer one uh, platform. Uh, it is a Rotom network uh, that allows traffic to effortlessly pass through uh, any number of nodes uh, on its way to, uh, to its destination. Uh, there is protection available. Uh, there is also per service configurable uh, security. Uh, so, in other words, you can sell encrypted services uh, for an electrical uh, utility, obviously security, that's a national security asset, right, the electrical grid. So they encrypt all of their traffic, uh, and all of that is done at layer one. Uh, it, layer one encryption uh, is at 256-bit uh, AES encryption, uh, and it adds zero latency to your to your traffic. So. Uh, it's a very efficient way to secure traffic. Um, and again, it's you're able to do that uh, on a per customer, per service basis. Um, the efficiencies lend, lent by a layer one network, uh, again, just to kind of hit them real quick, are really massive scalability. Uh, the ability to simply add another 200 or 400 or 600 gigabit wavelength uh, across the same uh, 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 routes that you're already running traffic. Uh, once we design an optical network for you, uh, we are taking into account all of the optical parameters, uh, signal to noise ratio, transmit and receive levels, um, uh, dispersion, uh, uh, dispersion compensation if necessary, certainly dispersion uh, that's handled by, uh, by coherent optics today. Uh, and so in the future, uh, with all of that in place, each successive wavelength that you turn up is, uh, is plug and play. All you've got to do is put in cards and optics on either end, and the wave will just come up and start carrying traffic. So one engineering uh, session at the very beginning, and then after that, uh, very straightforward to scale that network in a, in a cost efficient manner. Okay, so moving on, uh, this is this is what I call my layer cake design. So earlier we saw just the optical layer, right, with Apollo. Um, moving on to uh, going up higher up in the stack, right? So layer two, uh, even to layer three uh, uh, routing. So layer two switching, layer three routing. Uh, the product that we use for that is called Neptune. It is capable of both layer two and layer three operation. Uh, remember my upside down triangle, layer three is very expensive. So the way that we do that with the same box is the switch fabric modules, the actual hardware is capable of full layer three operation. But if you don't need layer three, then there's no reason for you to pay for it. So that those protocols are uh, locked, if you will. Uh, if all you want is a layer two ethernet switch. In many cases in the rural space uh, with ring architectures, uh, there is no need for uh, layer three, uh, layer three traffic handling, right? Uh, layer two will absolutely get the job done. And that's a great thing because it's less expensive. Uh, now, if you need layer three at some point, either at the beginning or at some point in the future, then it is simply purchasing a key code which unlocks all of those layer three features. There is no hardware update. There is no need to switch out switch fabrics. 
the box you have in your rack is already capable. You turn on the key code, now you have access to OSPF, ISIS, BGP, full IPM PLS capability uh, as, as you would expect it to. So the one, one uh, powerful uh, aspect of the Neptune is, is that it is uh, field upgradable uh, simply with, uh, with that, uh, that, uh, that key code. All right, so one other thing I wanna bring up uh, when we're looking at the layer cake diagram here is that uh, it's very common for us to build a, an optical backbone, say build the highway, uh, is another way to describe an optical backbone. Uh, we can handle uh, ring architectures, mesh, partial mesh, linear stud networks, whatever whatever topology you've got, uh, the, uh, the Apollo uh, is capable of supporting that. And then on top of that, we can put the layer two, layer three network. Um, one thing I'll mention to you is that everything that I show you, everything that we have, on the IP optical side of Ribbon uh, was designed, uh, conceived, manufactured, uh, and uh, is supported by our company, right? None of it was acquired from another company. Uh, it is all designed here in-house and manufactured here in-house. Uh, and so these devices, despite one of them being called Apollo and one of them being called Neptune, are designed and were designed from the very beginning to work hand in hand. One practical example of that is that the DWDM optics, uh, in a case where you've got an Apollo backbone and a Neptune layer two or layer three uh, set, uh, the, the DWDM optics uh, actually insert into the Neptunes and then plug directly into the Apollos, negating the need for intermediate transponders or media converters or gray wave optics or any of that expense. So it's a very cost effective way to build a layer one, layer two or layer three network. Um, now that said, I wanna say that we have a number of customers where we are building networks for them that are Neptune only. Uh, there may not be a need uh, for an Apollo backbone layer. Um, certainly, as I pointed out, Apollo has a lot of, a lot of value uh, in where we deploy it. However, for customers that are fiber rich and they don't particularly need uh, the scalability of DWDM, uh, maybe there are other considerations uh, where they are, where perhaps they've already got another DWDM system and they wanna put a Neptune in on top of that. Uh, there are even green greenfield opportunities where uh, where they've just decided they don't want any additional complexity. All they want is a set of, say, layer three routers that are interconnected uh, using, say, an, uh, an EVPN uh, uh, strategy. Um, all of those are available, right? So I, I wanna make sure that we're clear that, uh, that uh, Apollo can stand on its own, Neptune can stand on its own, and then Apollo and Neptune, of course, can work together to provide uh, uh, a very cost-effective and uh, and full-featured solution. So here's an example of a customer uh, that we have out west. Uh, this is a, a a large, what you might call tier three or a small tier two wireless provider. Uh, about 1,100 towers in their service area, um, and then thousands of kilometers of of fiber and they are uh, very aggressively growing. What they were looking for was a replacement for their existing non-scalable uh, DWDM solution. Uh, and so what we proposed was a combination of Apollo and Neptune, uh, Neptune operating at layer two. Uh, and so we ended up lighting up about 2000 kilometers of their fiber. That's so far uh, with quite a bit more in the planning stages. Um, this slide says 150 Apollo and Neptune nodes. It's actually more than that at this point. Uh, uh, it is a backbone uh, with tributaries that uh, operates over a 48 channel, uh, 200 gig qualified uh, 
uh, backbone, optical backbone via our Apollo solution. Uh, and then in each location, there are a pair of Neptunes that are providing not only hardware redundancy, uh, but obviously layer two ethernet services, including MPLS TP, uh, uh, MPLS uh, transport profile uh, protocol, which allows uh, working and protect paths uh, that will fail over uh, sub 50 millisecond. So quite a large service area. Their uh, design requirements were that where possible, uh, we would limit the, the uh, latency or the travel time. Um, now, when you have 2000 kilometers of fiber, um, a significant portion of, of latency is attributable to the speed of light through fiber. Um, that's that really becomes the limiting factor. So that's there's nothing we can do about that, according to Einstein. So uh, so what we do uh, is architect uh, the design so that there are low latency express routes, uh, so that we are not hitting switch after switch after switch. That uh, it certainly is not necessary for traffic that needs to home run to a data center. Um, we don't need to use the CPU and the and the memory cycles in the switches or the routers. Uh, and of course, light through fiber is the very fastest we can go, right? So that was a, certainly a design consideration. Uh, as time moves on and we have more and more advanced applications, you know, I'm fond of talking about that application five or six or seven years from now that is going to revolutionize the internet and everybody's going to want this app well i don't know what that app is but i can say a few things about it it's going to require low latency it's going to require uh high uptime high availability uh it's going to require a lot of bandwidth uh it's going to be very intolerant to delay right so as and this is there's nothing magical about that it's simply uh looking at the history of uh, of popular applications and so forth on the internet, you see that we're moving towards more and more and more of a, what you might call a realistic environment. Uh, I think you're seeing that uh, the early stages of that in the metaverse uh, uh, applications that are coming out. Uh, so in order to build a network that's going to be in, uh, in service for you, uh, we typically see 10 years or more uh, when we put a network in for our customers, that network has to be able to scale to that future app that we don't even know what to call it yet, right? It has to be able to support the the level of service delivery that we know is coming, right? So that is certainly a, an overriding uh, uh, design consideration for us. Uh, and that that goes back to cost efficiency and making sure that you don't end up forklifting gear uh uh in uh, before you've even uh, realized uh, your investment fully uh the other thing that i'll mention here it's not necessarily architectural but but it is of high value uh, particularly in an environment like this uh is our in-service otdr solution so everybody's familiar with otdr the difference with our solution is that it operates in service on a wavelength that is outside of the data uh, wavelengths, right? So we can run it in parallel with the data traffic and it is non-interfering and non-service affecting. Well, the, the value of that is, is pretty straightforward once you think about it for a moment, because now I've got a live OTR that I can take a shot anywhere I've got coverage in my fiber network um, and know immediately uh, what the condition of that fiber is. It proves itself even more so when uh, when you have a an outage, which invariably takes place in the middle of the night. Uh, so in this particular case, it will send out an alarm uh, and and mention that by the way there's a break, and by the way here's exactly where the break is. So the traditional troubleshooting situation where you've got loss of signal. Uh, and loss of frame being reported by your switches and so forth, then uh, you can uh, get into the console, do a quick OTR, 
and uh, get that data exactly where that problem is to within a meter or two. Now, that problem may take place, may have taken place in a CO. Uh, a fiber jumper may not be plugged in all the way. Uh, maybe a transceiver blew out, or maybe somebody's been, you know, backhoeing in the middle of the night. Uh, but the ability to know exactly where that problem is and then immediately dispatch a, uh, a truck to go fix it uh, is really invaluable. And that, that solution is, is priced so attractively that by the second time you use it, uh, it you've pretty much paid for it. Uh, there's also in-service signal monitoring here. This is part of our eye in the sky, if you will, kind of a knock engineer uh, watching your fiber transmission uh, uh, 24 by 7 and looking at things like uh, transmit and receive levels, uh, signal to noise ratio, uh, uh, polarization mode dispersion, chromatic dispersion, nonlinearities, all of these uh, uh, optical physics uh, characteristics that are part and parcel of DWM transmission. And signal monitoring will take care of all of that for you and then let you know if anything is diverging from the norm, right? So it's it's a little extra peace of mind to know that everything is operating in a healthy fashion. Okay, so from a layer two perspective and a layer three perspective, um, this is, uh, I mean, feel free to screenshot this. We are gonna send you a, uh, a PDF of this uh, presentation later. Uh, this is what we call our table stakes slide. Um, this is uh, what our uh, Neptune devices are capable of. It obviously represents both layer two and layer three. This is not an all-inclusive list. These are just the, well, like I said, they're the table stakes slide. These are the, the protocols that you've got to support uh, for today's and tomorrow's network, right? So these are all operational and ready to go today. Um, a couple of notes, uh, EVPN uh, is a, uh, a technology that I haven't seen very often. It's fairly new, uh, but if um, if you have an environment where active, active, uh, uh, failover, uh, and uh, 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 traffic patterns along those lines, um, then EVPN is certainly something to look at. Um, we are also uh, Carrier Ethernet 3.0 uh, certified. Um, segment routing, uh, segment routing, transport, uh, uh, traffic engineering, excuse me. Um, so a number of things on there that are, that are uh, uh, like I say, table stakes, but can really make a difference in the efficient operation of your network. Okay, so the last topic I wanna cover for you today uh, in our high level review is OTM switching. Um, this is a technology that's been around for a while, but it has been uh, really kind of relegated to the tier one providers because it has been very expensive. Uh, it is not something that you know the average rural provider uh, or even tier two provider uh, would would look at. Uh, but things have changed uh, recently in terms of uh, of the ability to provide this type of uh, of uh, switching. Uh, and traffic forwarding uh, in, in a very cost efficient manner. So very quickly, this is a tutorial for OTN switching. Um, so OTN is nothing more than data containers that work a lot like the old Sonic containers did, OC3, OC12, OC48, uh, except we call them OTU, right? So OTU2 is about 10 gig in size. And so I'm gonna use that as an example. So all of these technologies, 10 gig, OC192, and fiber channel 10, can all fit in an OTU2 container, okay? So if I'm running a pair of giggies, 10 giggies, and an OC192, and a fiber channel, then I've got four wavelengths I'm running. Either that's over DWDM, or I'm running four different fiber pairs. With OTN switching, I can use the larger container, an OTU4, and run one wavelength, and then I can multiplex all these different types of traffic. Uh, so Ethernet, fiber channel, uh, sonic traffic, there are other video uh, 
uh, formats that we can uh, uh, that we can multiplex as well. Now I've got one container that has multiple different kinds of traffic in it, and I have collapsed what was four fiber pairs down to one fiber pair. Um, so just another way to multiplex traffic. Uh, one of the most effective ways that I've seen this used is in a situation like this. This is a uh, representative of an access ring. Uh, and so uh, in a lot of rural uh, communities, you are still supporting those sub rate sonnet services. But at the same time, you also need to run native ethernet, right? Uh, and so instead of running multiple boxes and multiple channels uh, and then putting rotoms in or filters or anything else that makes that so complex, you can put a box such as our 9901X in there. This is a device that runs 100 gig both east and west. You can also run 10 gig if you choose. And then all of the client ports are capable of accepting fiber channel sonnet or ethernet, right? So if you look here uh, in the uh, 20 times SFP or SFP plus, I can do one gig, 10 gig, OTU1, OTU2s, these are uh, obviously OTN format uh, containers, and then uh, TDM traffic as well, right? I can multiplex all of that together in a single wavelength, and then I can add, drop, and continue any of those traffic types anywhere around that ring at any site, right? So it is, this is not a technology that we typically recommend for an entire network, but where you have a scenario where you are combining different traffic types and you don't want to use an old inefficient Ethernet over Sonnet solution uh, and you don't want to burn multiple pairs of fiber um, with multiple devices and multiple management systems, um, this is uh, really tailor made for that type of solution. Okay, so uh, I'm right at the bottom of the hour here. Uh, again, uh, I appreciate your time uh, looking at the highlights of what Ribbon, uh, Ribbon's architectural approach is uh, for layer one, layer two, and layer three, uh, as well as uh, OTN switching, which, which I guess we consider layer one, uh, a layer one technology. Um, in successive tech talks, we're going to be covering each of these topics uh, in more detail. The next one uh, is uh, DWDM. Uh, and I've got a slide for that here in a minute. I do want to leave this up here for a minute and point out that uh, everything that we build is a global solution. So it is standards based. Um, uh, and uh, obviously both IP and optical. Uh, Ribbon's IP optical solutions uh, are deployed in 140 countries around the world from local rural providers uh, here in the United States all the way to uh, defense agencies uh, of uh, various countries around the world. So it's a very secure, uh, uh, highly reliable solution, uh, necessarily. Um, we do not charge persistent licensing fees. So once you buy the software, uh, the software is yours to keep, right? We will never be coming back to you and asking you to relicense or release software from us. Uh, we don't do, we, that's not how we operate. Uh, our model is very much a pay-as-you-grow model. Again, we expect our equipment to be in your enterprise for a minimum of 10 years. We have customers that we've been supporting for over 20 years. Um, our design philosophy is that the equipment should be uh, resistant to forklift upgrades, that we use the chassis architecture as long as we possibly can, that the, the cards that you first start off with uh, in some cases, uh, we have customers that started off with uh, 10 gig cards, uh, and today they're running 400 gig out of that same chassis on a wavelength, right? So pay as you grow model. Uh, we are Buy America Act compliant. So for a number of you, you may be considering accepting USDA, RUS money, or other money uh, from government agencies. There is a requirement there that you that you must uh, uh, comply 
with country of origin uh, requirements. Uh, uh, another way to describe it is the Buy America Act. Uh, we are compliant with that. Uh, and currently, uh, we are at a 10 to 12 week delivery on the entire portfolio. So um, we, we have uh, done a great job of logistics management. Uh, and so everything that you uh, place an order for from us can be delivered within that time frame. Uh, and, and that is held for uh, pretty much for months now. So uh, the, supply, the supply chain issues uh, have really not hit us that hard. Okay, as I mentioned, next time we're gonna talk about DWDM, right? Uh, and basically point out how it's really not all that difficult. Um, uh, the, you know, the, the great news is, is that we do the design for you. <laughs> uh, and, and more than happy to, you know, to go through the, the ins and the outs of the design with you, but all of the heavy lifting uh, will be done by your ribbon engineers. Um, and you just tell us what you need and then we'll design to that spec. Uh, and then finally, I'd like you to save the date. Uh, uh, we have a tech forum coming up. This is the first one of its kind uh, from the new uh, Ribbon IP Optical folks. And uh, it is currently scheduled for November 2nd, 3rd. Um, there's a golf day before that, because uh, we would never do anything like this without putting a golf day in. Uh, so that'll be on the first. Uh, and then, uh, there's uh, breakfast and sort of a wrap up on the fourth, but the the essence of the show is uh, November second and third. It'll be at the Weston Galleria in Dallas, Texas, uh, and this is going to be an opportunity for you to look at everything from an IP optical perspective, as well as the best of our cloud communication division, um, where you're going to have uh, uh, executives from the company uh, as well as guest speakers. Uh, from outside of Ribbon, uh, as well as our technical folks there to demonstrate gear, uh, answer your questions. Uh, we're even gonna do some a session where uh, you can stump the chumps and uh, throw questions at us in front of a whiteboard and we can, uh, we can uh, sort through uh, uh, naughty network problems. So I uh, want you just to save the date for now. Very soon in the coming days, you will be uh, seeing uh, more details on that <coughs> and uh, the ability to register for. It. Okay, thanks very much for your time. Uh, if there are any questions uh, that have not been answered by my trusty sidekick, uh, we can bring those up now. Otherwise, I'll turn it over to you, Lance. Thanks, Jack. Uh, no questions um, at this point, but I will say uh, if you do have any questions that maybe come to mind later, uh, please let us know. Uh, I think Elizabeth put her information there in the chat, um, epage at rbbn.com. You can always reach out to her. Um, and as Jack mentioned too, uh, the tech forum, uh, you can find that online. You know, go to ribboncommunications.com. You can search for all of these things and you can also get a hold of us there quite simply. So. I appreciate your time today. Um, as Jack mentioned, you'll be getting an email at some point today with a link to the replay um, and also some slides. Uh, so take a look at those. Feel free to reply to that email with additional questions. And then we will remind you about the DWDM demystified uh, uh, topic that comes up on Tuesday the 16th, as well as all the other ones. You are already registered for all of them. So we'd love to see you back for all those other topics. You will be getting reminders about those before they before they start. Share with your colleagues. We'd love to have more on as well. So again, thanks for your time today. Um, we really appreciate you attending these webinars and we look forward to speaking with you all very soon. Great. Have a great day. Thanks everyone.